Greetings in the Lord. Whether you're watching this on Sunday morning or any time of the day or the week, it is wonderful to be able to worship the Lord with you today. My name is Pastor Greg Braun. I have the privilege of being the minister here at Byron United Church for whom Jesus Christ is Lord. I pray that you are well and that you are being safe. Let us worship the Lord together. United Church family. It's a pleasure to worship with you today. Let's gather together in prayer. Loving Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the health and the blessings and the strength that we do have. Thank you, God, for this time of rest, of slower pace, of isolation in which we can draw closer to you. In this time, Lord, we can let the noise of the world quiet down, and we can learn to listen more to your voice, to feel the promptings of your spirit as the noise and clamor of the usual comes to a halt. Thank you, Father that no matter what we are doing, no matter where we are, we are never alone, you are always with us. Thank you that we have our brothers and sisters with us in this family, joined together by your spirit. May we continue to worship as one, no matter where we are. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Join me now, if you will, in the singing of the Lord's Prayer.
as we do each week, let us celebrate some milestones, birthdays, and anniversaries within our church family. Fatty Odicho, one of our Syrian friends, is graduating this spring from Fanshawe College from their architectural design program. Some recent birthdays. Evelyn Hick has turned 93. Carol Breen's mother, Jean King, has turned 90. Christy and Nick Cumley have both celebrated birthdays, along with Gail Gay Whaley, Ralph Neely, Denise Gibson, Cheryl Chambers, Penny Forrett, Crawford Stevens, and Linda Peck. And we have a number of anniversaries. Recently, Ron and Joan Nichols have celebrated their 63rd, and Bruce and Joan Esterbrooks have celebrated their 43rd. Coming up this week, we have Mary and Harry Huffman celebrating their 47th this coming Tuesday. Uh, Teresa and Ted Vandenberg celebrating two years on Tuesday as well. And Joan and John McLean celebrating their 55th anniversary this coming Friday. We celebrate with all of you. We rejoice that the Lord has blessed you and we worship and praise him with our celebrate song. <laughs> My name is Ron Carruthers, and I'm the facilitator of Assets and Finance, and that includes three great teams, our property team, our finance team, and our stewardship team. And our property team is looking for one or two more additions right now, and if you might be that person, I would love to hear from you. A few weeks back, Ruth Dean gave us an update on our givings. They are good, and thanks for your commitment to our church. In these uncertain times, it is difficult to talk about givings. On the other hand, when some of us have more time, it may be the perfect opportunity to talk about how we give. If your family has just lost a major part of your income, your church food bank is here to help you. Assuming that your family has a stable income or increase in income, why not think about your church givings via PAR, which is pre-authorized remittance? Now could be the best time, and the process is easy. Firstly, you fill out a PAR form that I will deliver to you. Return the form to our church via mail, or RC pickup, that is, Ron Carruthers pickup. The dollar amount that you designate on your PAR form will be withdrawn from your bank account once per month. You make one, and here's the easy part. You make one phone call to Deb, our church administrator, to do anything you want with PAR. You can cancel PAR. You can increase your PAR amount or decrease your PAR amount. I'm happy to tell you we now have 80 families using PAR. Now let me leave you with two quotes. The first is from Anne Frank. No one ever became poor by giving. My personal situation is that the more I give, the more I have to give. The second quote is, we make a living by what we get but we make a life by what we give. And that quote was from Winston Churchill. Thanks very much for your strong support of our church in these difficult times. My prayer is that you all stay safe, healthy, and strong.
it's great to be with you today, uh, even if it's only in this strange way. But um, I trust that you'll be blessed by today's service and find the presence of God with you wherever you are. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 15, beginning at verse 1. Hear the word of God. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. As I begin my sermon this morning, I would like to start by showing you something here in Rick Graham's office. Rick, we're coming into your office. There's his desk. But over here on the bookshelf behind Rick's desk are all of these photo albums. We have years and years worth of photo albums. And I would bet that most of us have photo albums in our homes. And it's interesting to look through the albums and, oh, there's some people we recognize. Yeah, it's interesting to look through the albums and see um, how we and others used to look, how uh, <clears throat> clothing fashions and hairstyles have changed. They remind us of things that we've done, people we've known, places we've gone, and they remind us who we are, where we've come from. And so uh, I think during these days, uh, we may all have a lot of opportunity to maybe go through some of our old albums and pictures and make sure that uh, we've got the <clears throat> names and dates on the backs of things like uh, we've been planning to do for all these years. As we head toward the sanctuary, we've got more photos here on the wall. Um, let's see here, we've got There's Dr. Gary Badcock, who did our scripture reading for us today. And there's Rebecca Evans, one of our song leaders today. The Bible is a lot like a family photo album. The Bible shows us who our mothers and fathers in the faith were. It shows us how God has been at work in history. And it shows us who we are, where we've come from, where we belong. You recall that a few weeks ago, we looked at the passage of uh, what happened on that first Easter day when um, there were rumors that, that Jesus was risen from the dead. And so we looked at how uh, Cleopas and Mary were walking along the road to Emmaus and how the risen Jesus came and walked with them, uh, but they didn't recognize him. 
and how Jesus had to explain to them how all of these things, beginning with Moses and the prophets, uh, had to happen to himself. And so he was walking Cleopas and Mary through the family album and uh, showing them how God had been at work in their lives and how God was, was bringing them, the whole nation, to this day, to this point in history when Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, would come and would suffer and die and be raised from the dead. And so uh, when we look through a, a family album, especially if we do it with a, a younger person, someone, you know, a child or a grandchild or niece or nephew, and we're able to point out to them, oh, look, there's, you know, uh, your great-grandmother who came from Germany when she was seven uh, and various things like that. It can be a, a real joy and a delight for them to be able to recognize that they're part of a, a story, part of a, a, a movement, part of, of a history that is so much bigger than themselves. And we have the same experience. When we look through the Bible, we say, there's Father Abraham. And look, look, here is the time that God made a covenant with him that he would be the father of a great nation. Oh, look, here's uh, our, our ancestor Ruth. And this is a picture of when uh, she trusted in the Lord to provide for her. Oh, and, and here's the prophet Isaiah uh, proclaiming to the people that God would raise up one who would die for their sins. And so as we, we encounter this passage uh, written by Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, uh, I just want to give you a little bit of background first on the history around uh, Paul and, and the writing of this passage. And so um, we know that Paul had been a very devout Jew who was uh, absolutely dead set against uh, these Jews who were becoming followers of Jesus, who proclaimed that he had uh, been raised from the dead. And, um, and so Paul was going around with the authority of the Jewish leaders to arrest uh, uh, Jews who were believing in Jesus have them put in prison, and on his way to Damascus, similar to the, the Emmaus Road experience for uh, Cleopas and Mary, um, Paul was heading on the road to Damascus when the risen Lord appeared to him and said, Paul, Paul, or Saul, Saul, as he was called back then, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And, and Saul was like, who are you? And Jesus said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And so that Damascus Road experience transformed Saul, uh, who later uh, was renamed Paul, to become one of the great advocates for Jesus, the Son of God, risen from the dead. And so uh, Paul uh, and, and the disciples and all of those first believers began to share this good news throughout uh, the entire known world. And so uh, at one point, Paul traveled to the Greek city of Corinth. Uh, this would have been about the year 53, uh, about 20 years after Jesus' resurrection. And as Paul normally did when he entered uh, a city, he went to the Jewish quarter. Uh, and he went to the synagogue and he uh, shared this good news that the Messiah had come, that God's promises had been fulfilled. <laughs> and, and he, you know, uh, gave them evidence and proof that, that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus had risen from the dead. And so Paul stayed in the city of Corinth for about 18 months, sharing this good news. Uh, some of the Jews believed, others didn't, and eventually they said, you know, Paul, stop coming to the synagogue. We don't want to hear uh, what you're selling anymore. Uh, but there were others who became believers. Non-Jews uh, became a, became Believers in this uh, Jesus Christ who had died for them and raised from the dead. And so we now have a community made up of Jews who believed and non-Jews who believed. And they would worship together and share together and learn and grow and, and provide for each other together. Uh, and the Holy Spirit was with them and acting in very real and powerful ways. Well, after about 18 months, Paul felt that God was calling him on. And so he uh, traveled to other towns and cities. And so it was probably a few years later, uh, while Paul was in Ephesus, um, where he was for three years, that he was having some 
correspondence back and forth with his sisters and brothers in Corinth, with, that is, his, his Christian sisters and brothers. And so, uh, you know, they would send him an email and say, Paul, we're, we're wrestling with this issue and we don't know how to deal with it. And then there's this theological question. And so they'd send him an email and, and Paul would pray about the situation and then he would uh, email them back. <clears throat> I'm, I'm being humorous, of course. There's nobody here to laugh at my jokes. Obviously, they were writing letters, and this was not a, a fast uh, or an easy process. They would, you know, write a letter and, and get it to Paul with a, you know, some sort of uh, person would have to go and deliver this letter to Paul in Ephesus, and Paul would have to, uh, to write a letter in return and, and have someone take it back. And, and so we're not just talking about, you know, a few days. We're talking about weeks or even months in between sending a letter and uh, receiving one back. And Paul is very concerned about these uh, brothers and sisters in the faith that he loves, that he helped to uh, uh, establish this Christian community in Corinth, and so he is trying to address their issues and their struggles uh, in these letters, which are called First and Second Corinthians. And so Paul is talking about very real and specific problems and concerns that, that these Christians in Corinth are wrestling with. And at this point, particular point in his letter, uh, Paul is addressing the fact that the, the Corinthian Christians have told him that there are some among them uh, who are saying that, no, 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 there is no resurrection from the dead. Now, we have those kinds of similar parallels in our church today. Not everybody believes exactly the same thing, uh, and that's okay. Uh, and there are people who uh, say that, you know, uh, that we should be believing this or we should believe, be believing that or that never actually happened uh, in the Bible or, or we have to believe this. There's all kinds of differences of opinions and understanding. But this particular issue that the Corinthians were wrestling with were these statements that some uh, Christians were making that, no, no, there is no resurrection of the dead. And so Paul reminds them of the good news. And we realize, of course, that the good news is news. And news is not some fiction that somebody invent invented. News is something that's occurred, uh, that spreads from person to person, uh, you know, and it ends up on TV and radio and websites and newspapers. Uh, Paul had received the good news from Jesus himself when Jesus appeared to him on that road to Damascus, that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, crucified and risen from the dead. And so um, this is the good news that, that Paul had preached to them and that they were now beginning to have some doubts or questions about. And so out of his love and concern for these fellow believers, Paul is breaking down for them this good news. He's reminding them. He's, he's showing them through the family photo album again. And he's saying, look, here's a picture of Jesus dying on the cross. You see, there's his mother Mary standing near the cross. And look, here are some of the women bearing him in that borrowed tomb. We turn the page and we see that the stone is rolled back. Easter morning. The tomb is empty. Jesus is risen. And he's appearing to the women. He's appearing to Peter. He's appearing to the 12 disciples. See, here's the time he appeared to uh, the disciples and Thomas wasn't there. And then when we turn the page here, there, here's a picture from a week later where, where Thomas was there, and we can see the look on Thomas' face as he touched the wounds in Jesus' hand and side. This is good news. Look at the pictures. And here's the time Jesus appeared to 500 people all at the same time. And we know many of these people, and many of them are still alive today. 
Paul's reminding them. He's walking them through the family album. And look, here's a picture of when Jesus appeared to his brother James. And here's the time when I was traveling that road to Damascus to arrest the believers, to put them into prison. And here, Jesus appeared to me. Look, this is good news. This is what I preach to you. This is what you believe. Now, there may be people who say there is no resurrection from the dead. And we're not just talking about going to heaven when we die. We're talking about a physical resurrection, like Jesus himself, who was able to eat, who was able to be touched and held. We, like Jesus, will have resurrection bodies. And so if there are people among you who have a, a different understanding than that, who, who don't believe this good news, don't be swayed by them. Love them. Be good to them. But don't, don't be taken in by their lack of faith or by their misunderstanding. We celebrate and proclaim this good news. Jesus Christ crucified and risen. And we too shall be resurrected from the dead like him. We realize that Christianity is not a set of rules. Christianity is not a spiritual path. Christianity is not a political agenda. It may have elements of those aspects of life. But first and foremost, Christianity is good news about real events that happen to real people in real places at real times. And they all revolve around Jesus Christ and his death and his resurrection from the dead. And so Paul, like the disciples, like those 500 witnesses, have received this good news, have uh, undertaken a ministry to share this good news, that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, that he is uh, Lord and Master of life, of death, and of new life, that he died to forgive us of our sins, and that we can enter into a relationship with him and his Heavenly Father by the Holy Spirit at work in us. And so look through your family photo album. Look through this album of, of real people experiencing God's real power and work in their lives. Remind yourself that you are a member of a great and glorious family that God is continuing to bless, to heal, to restore, to save. You are a part of this story that continues until Christ returns or he calls us home. So hear again the words that St. Paul wrote to these Christians in Corinth. He says, now, sisters and brothers, I want you, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, which you receive this good news and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Hold on to this good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Seek to follow him. Seek to know him. Rejoice in him. And share this good news with all the world. Alleluia and Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we prepare our hearts and minds for prayer, we invite your Holy Spirit to be present with us, wherever we may be. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we continue to pray for an end to this coronavirus and for the victims and caregivers throughout the world. May we remember to turn to you for our strength and peace. 
throughout the resurrection of Jesus, through the resurrection of Jesus, who fulfilled scripture and rose from the dead to save us from our sins, we have faith that we can rely on you to be our light in our darkest days. Focus our minds on the blessings that we have, food, shelter, warmth, friends, family. Lord, we live in a global village where the news is instant and sensational. And while this news serves to inform us, it can also cause confusion and despair. We only need to ask you for peace and comfort when we are burdened by our anxieties, because Jesus is always near to us. We pray for wisdom for our world leaders as they make decisions about the future of their jurisdictions. We pray for the scientific community as they seek to find a cure for this mysterious virus. We thank you for our Pastor Greg and our leadership team as they discern the ways that we can once again be together in safety. We pray for your divine protection over Greg and his family, for Rick and Colin and their families as they work to reach out to our church, and for Andrea Smith and her family as she continues her Sunday school videos for the children. We pray for our finances during these days when our pews are empty. We have faith that you will provide for us as we do your will. Lord, we celebrate the 47th wedding anniversary of Harry and Mary Huffman this Tuesday and the 55th anniversary of John and Joan McLean next Friday. We also celebrate the 93rd birthday of Evelyn Hick last Tuesday and the birthday of Denise Gibson last Saturday. Lord, we thank you for all your multitude of blessings. And in your blessed name, we praise you and thank you. Amen.
have worshiped the Lord, we have been reminded that we are his family, his beloved children, that he is with us always. Let us go with the confidence, knowing that we are his now and forevermore. Amen. <music>